So, Pastor, if you can kindly pray and... Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> you know, at times these things happen, but ultimately, you know, God helps us to resolve. Yeah. So, we really thank God for all this. And we welcome you all to this Milk to Meet Bible study session this Sunday. Let's start with a word of prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with thankful hearts. Lord, hitches are there, difficulties are there, oh God, but Father, you always find a way for us to come out of all of them because you really want us to enjoy this fellowship of milk to meet, oh God, and you really want us to enjoy uh, studying your words, oh Father, and so you have definitely found a way for us to come together and helping Lord Mano to present the material before us. So Lord, we are very thankful to you. And as Lord, we enter into this time of studies, Pray, O oh God, that let your Holy Spirit guide us, O oh God, and provide us with the meat that we need, O oh God, and enlighten our understanding, O oh God, and also help Mano, Father, to present, speak, share the ideas, and I pray, Lord, that you be, be, be his mouth, Father, and put your ideas, uh, your thoughts, everything, Lord, in his mouth, O oh God, so that when he speaks, Father, we definitely hear your voice. We thank you, Lord, for helping him to come up with these studies, and thank you, God, for his commitment, Father, and I pray that you bless him and his entire family, and bless us also, Lord, as we study your words. Help us, God, to take things to our hearts, and Lord, but also give them out to people, Lord, wherever we meet them, whenever we meet them, oh God, so that your kingdom will be extended. And to that end, we commit ourselves in your mighty power and this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank, thank you so much for patiently waiting. Uh, welcome to Milk to Meet. Welcome to the Kingdom and Covenant Program of God. It's April 18, 2021, Year of the Lord. And today's topic I actually want, wanted to share is the tabernacle with man. And there is an amazing picture that will emerge as we go through this study. Um, you know, since we are hard pressed on time a little bit today, I'm going to continue through um, at a more accelerated pace in the initial part of the study and then we'll kind of want to, I want to get to the meat of it towards the end. So Psalm 80, 84, one talks about how amiable are thy tabernacles or Lord of hosts, essentially, which can be rendered as how lovely is your dwelling place, uh, O Lord of hosts. And the question I want to ask each one of us is, when if God sees our hearts, is that going to be an amiable place for him to dwell? And the way that it connects to the scripture is, the psalmist says, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you, so that it's a place that is amiable unto God. And so we ought to hide God's word in our hearts. And as we come to this Bible study, that is my prayer that we take what we learn, hide on, hide it in our hearts so that God can actually make his dwelling place so that we are sanctified and holy and not sinful for he can have no communion with, with any sin itself. So uh, with that said, We've been studying the kingdom and covenant program of God, and then how the salvation court kind of intertwines between the two from the book of Genesis all the way to Revelation. And, uh, you know, as these things emerge, we get to know a little bit more about God and our response to him should be in reverence of worship and service and uh, a response of love back to him. So... Um, uh, in, in terms of the, 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 the recap from last week, we learned the Mosaic Covenant is a bilateral conditional covenant. It was a conditionality of the choice to obey or to disobey. Uh, it was a choice that was given to obey, uh, you know, but you can choose to disobey too. The commandment of the law is given to teach Israel how to be in a love relationship with God. When he gave the law, it was a reflection of his character and his very essence and how we can be in response loving as loyal servants of his. Uh, if, if Israel chooses to disobey God's commandments, it will become insignificant, which is really the aspect of the curse. Uh, Pastor, after he heard last week's message, he, was, he called me and he spoke and we, we had a time of discussion where he was talking about the response that we have is one of loyalty as, you know, as, uh, the word he was taught using was loyalty in terms of loyalty back in response to knowing the law as if you've taken a wedding vow. And then, you know, we're now being faithful and loyal to that relationship with God. If we choose to be adulterous as a perverse, a perverse generation going after other gods and other pleasures and other things that we put in the position of God, 
then we fall outside the protection and provision of God, but he's still faithful because he is God who loves and cares and his loving kindness is better than life. But we enjoy his presence, his protection and his provision where we are in that faithful relationship with him. But he cannot deny himself because he is faithful. God is what the scripture you know, says in Timothy as a trustworthy saying, uh, which we saw last week. Uh, the Mosaic Covenant is about the love of God and the law of God and the love for God. And that's essentially where we landed last week. Um, so if I was to um, go into um, uh, the Exodus itself, what we've seen so far is 1 to 18 is talking about, you know, the chapters are talking about taking an outline of Exodus will tell you how God is taking his people out of Egypt. And then 19 to 20, 19 to 40 is actually more in this, in, you may have heard the sayings, taking Egypt out of his people. Uh, but then 19 to 24 actually starts off with that covenant that is given a covenant of law and love, which talks about relationships. So post redemption from one to 18 that we read as God, where he's the salvation of the Lord is what is experienced is what Moses says in Exodus 14. Then we see through from 15 through 18, we see how God is their provider giving them manna and meat. And then God is their protector as well with the first Amalekite war that Israel will fight in. And then 19 to 24 is the Mosaic covenant, which talks about the relationship post-redemption. And then 25 to 40 is actually the whole aspect, if you can summarize, that whole thing would come under the context of reverence and response or responsibility as priest. And the two things, two pictures that will emerge is the tabernacle, which is the aspect of the pattern for worship, and then the priesthood, which is the aspect of service. And we'll kind of see uh, more today on the context of the tabernacle and we'll expand more on the priesthood and other things in subsequent studies. So when I was to, if I was to ask you the question, what does the tabernacle mean? When, when I say tabernacle, what does that mean? Or what picture comes to mind? It's not a very common word we use today, but you know, in the, in the context of just day-to-day -day communication, but what does tabernacle mean? It was the, oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, Dorothy said dwelling in. Dwelling in, okay. Very nice. Uh, Sister Katie? Um, it was the, the temporary um, a portable place of worship before uh, the temple was actually built. Okay. And then it's, it's interesting you say that, and then we'll actually see how the temple also will get redefined. So Exodus chapter 25 through 31, anyone else have any other thoughts around, like it's, you can say it's a dwelling in, a dwelling place, a temporary holding place, a tent of meeting. There are multiple ways in which the word tabernacle is used in a biblical context, but it's essentially, it comes down to the word dwell, right? So Exodus chapter 25 to 31, and then from 35 to 38, it speaks about the tabernacle that God wants his people to build. And if you go through and read that scripture part, it may seem like there's a lot of repetition of details that sometimes may feel like, why is there so much details? But what I want you to recognize is in, in, the, in the Lexem Bible dictionary, it talks about a tent that Israelites con constructed during their wilderness wanderings, the place where God dwelt among the Israelites. And then it's very significant in the Israelite religious system because it talks about the tabernacle or the Mishkan and the temple, which Sister Katie was talking about, it's the Migdash, which is reference to the synagogue actually in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the place of worship itself. But the tabernacle starts to emerge or give a picture of worship or habitation. The whole aspect is about dwelling and a place of God's abode. Now God is in the heavenlies and he's in the heavens and he cannot be contained on earth. And yet he chooses to live among man and to dwell among men in a place where he commissions in this Exodus account, a place that he says, I want you all to build. Now, the pattern of the tabernacle, and I'll kind of get into the elements of it as well, the pattern of the tabernacle over here is that there is an outer court, and then there is an inner court, which is the Holy of Holies, the, there's a holy place, and then there is a holy of holies place as well. And I want to kind of see, I want to actually go through in the building of the tabernacle and take you on this journey with me, where, you know, I, we don't have time to read through all of it, but I'll at least read the highlighted parts over here. So, Exodus 27, 9 to 19 talks about you shall make a coat of the tabernacle on the south side, on the north side, on the east side, on the west side. So pretty much every side that will be covered by, by linen, fine linen. It will be 100 cubits long. A cubit is about 18 inches, one and a half feet. So it's about 150 feet. The breadth would be 50 feet, which is about 75 feet. And the height will be five cubits of fine linen. Five cubits is seven and a half feet of linen and brass. And when you're reading this, you're like, why is God giving so much of these details? Like, what's the point of this? And then what you 
you'll end up actually noticing is from 25 to 31, he'll actually give the instructions to build the tabernacle. And then in the um, 35 uh, onwards, he'll act, they'll actually be building it and he'll kind of reiterate the same thing. So it's almost like a repetition. And he says, all the vessels of the tabernacle and the service thereof, and they shall be brass. So things in the outer court you will notice will be actually of brass. And as you go closer in and in, it'll have more value, but it'll end up becoming gold and pure gold is what God will actually ask the, the commission the people to build through Moses. The tabernacle in its inner court over had many curtains. It was curtains, 10 curtains, and then curtains of goat hair upon the tabernacle, 11 curtains. So he gives different curtains that need to be made in terms of covering. And then he even gives details of the clasps clasps that will hold the curtain so that there'll be one and then he gives instructions about all the upright frames and the side frames so exodus 26 1 to 27 actually describes that whole the whole chapter there kind of describes about the covering of the inner place and what needs to be in place and then he'll start to go into the most holy of holy so once there's the covering on the outside and then he'll god will give instructions in exodus chapter 26 verse 31 to 33 that you will make a whale you will make a whale that will actually separate the holy place from the most holy place on the, which is on the inside and we'll actually see what makes these places holy with regard to the furnishings that are in the tabernacle itself and then on the on 26 to 36 to 26 36 to 37 he'll actually talk about a screen door a screen door on five pillars that has to be hosted where it'll talk about a curtain that needs to be placed as well and this screen door will actually separate the outer court from the inner holy place and then the whale will separate the holy place from the most holy place or the holy of holies and what you'll notice is interestingly both of them in terms of material have the same it'll be made of blue purple scarlet and fine linen it'll be you know the outer coat will be made of blue purple the outer uh, screen will be made of blue purple scarlet and fine twine linen the difference though will be that he will say for the whale it'll have to be which cherubim he'll actually god will actually ask them to put the cherubim in and that gives us a picture of Eden where the cherubim are kept from reaching for the man to go back in to the most holy place to actually take from the tree of life and eat and then in so so God will and we'll see in the redemptive work of Christ how that is actually removed completely because the whale is torn when Christ is you know crucified and through his death he brings access into the holy most holy place of God but it's kind of interesting how God is taking from Eden to the wilderness now and he's kind of having this aspect of this pattern that he's starting to to start to divulge and show through just the elements of the tabernacle that he's commissioning the Israelites to build. Now there are different instruments in the tabernacle and the different instruments in the tabernacle that you will see are the Ark of the Covenant, the table for showbread, and we'll kind of expand on these a little bit more as to how this emerges in the pattern of redemption of God and then his service, his, his, his plan for man to be, be in response and reverence to him. So we have the Ark of the Covenant, the table for showbread, the golden lampstand, the bronze altar for sacrifice, the gold altar of incense, and the bronze basin. Now it's crucial we understand the elements of this because in the Ark of the Covenant, what God is telling is you shall make, Exodus chapter 25, verse 10 to 11, it says you shall make this Ark of the Covenant with shittim wood, which shittim is actually acacia wood, and it's a wood that was more prevalent in the time and the place over there in that geography. Uh, people try to give a, 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 a Christian biblical significance to it, but there's really no scripture substantiating to as to what why God said acacia wood, like he said, go for wood for the Ark of Noah. He said, uh, you know, we, we just take it at face value, and it says that in that place there were more uh, acacia was was a more prevalent wood and it was more resistant to uh, to bugs and all, so it may have been for longevity of the wood, but God in his own infinite wisdom said, you shall make this of shit and wood or acacia wood, we shall overlay it with pure gold and make a crown of gold, which is actually this crown of gold over here, which talks about the, the, the kingship of God. Then what God says is in Exodus chapter 25 or 16, you shall put the testimony within, which is the tablets you shall put within. So the law is kept within the Ark of the Covenant. And then over here on the Exodus 25, 17 to 18 and 21 to 22, he says, you shall now put a mercy seat on top of it, which will be a mercy seat made of pure gold, make two cherubims of gold and put the mercy seat above the ark and in the ark we shall put the testimony and I will meet with you there. I will commune with you from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubims 
which are upon the ark of the testimony of all the things which I give you to. So this emerges a picture of the law that is in the covenant, which is not removed out of the covenant. It is in the covenant. And then the mercy seat or grace of God that is on top of it. So Christ, he brings the, the grace of God on top of the law where he came and he came and said, the law has been fulfilled in him, in Christ, as we read in, in the book of Luke chapter 24. And so he doesn't abolish the law or annul the law, but he completes it and fulfills it. And then his mercy seat is on, on top of it. And it's a beautiful picture for us to kind of keep in mind as we go to see the parallel of this elements of the tabernacle in Christ himself. So the next one over here that God tells them to build is actually a table for showbread. He says, you shall make a table of showbread. You shall also overlay that with pure gold and make a crown of gold around it. Again, kingship over there is mentioned in terms of the crown of gold, pure gold, which is divinity, the gift that is given to kings as was given to Christ at his birth, frankincense, myrrh, and gold, right? Gold, myrrh, and frankincense. And, and you shall set the table of showbread. This is showbread is also known as the bread of the presence to, to indicate the presence of the Lord before me always, which means perpetually there will be bread on that table is essentially what, and we'll see what the significance of that is, is as we go through the study itself. The third element that God tells, to, or actually the, the, one, of the, one of the other element that he tells to, to, to make is the candlestick of pure gold. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 31 to 40, we read, you shall make a candlestick of pure gold and thou shall make seven lamps thereof and they shall light the lamps and they shall give light. And then he goes on to say at the very end, look that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed to thee in the mount. So make sure you don't deviate at all from any of the patterns that I'm giving you, because it's crucial for you to take the letter to, you know, to the jot and tittle so that you don't deviate anything from what I'm asking you to do. And he asked them to make a golden lampstand in, to, be, to be placed in the tabernacle. We'll kind of see where they're actually placed and what the significance of that as well as we go through the study. Then God tells about a bronze altar that needs to be made for sacrifice. Notice all the elements in the inner space is actually the inner coat is actually more is of pure gold. And this will be placed outside. And he talks about, you know, you shall make an altar of wood, right? Shed and wood, acacia wood. There should be horns uh, on it and they shall overlay it with brass. And he's talking about how this will be the place that you will actually place, that this will be placed in the outer court, as we'll see in terms of the commissioning of where you would want to place this. But God is saying, you shall make this of wood and then you shall actually overlay it with brass. It'll be a meant for sacrifice. Then he actually talks about what's called a bronze laver or a bronze basin. He said, thou shalt also make, Exodus chapter 30, verse 17 to 21, thou shalt also make a laver of brass, a brass uh, or bronze and his foot also of brass to wash with all and you shall put water therein and then he says and when the priests come in when the Aaron and his sons they'll come in they'll wash their hands and their feet and when they get into the tabernacle of the congregation right they shall wat wash with water that they die not they shall wash their hands and their feet that they die not so twice God is actually telling over there repeatedly like he says it once and then he repeats it again to say there'll be water there by which they should be washed so that they do not die and it's very important to recognize like what's the significance of this as part of the bronze labor that we'll study in in a couple of minutes from now the last uh, element or the furnishing in the tabernacle or the instrument of the tabernacle is Exodus 30 verse 1 to 10 and thou shall make an altar to burn incense upon in the of, of, of this acacia wood you shall overlay it with pure gold so this would indicate that this has to not be placed in the outer court it has to be placed in the inner court and shall make unto it a crown of gold round about so again talking about the kingship of God and the kingship of of, uh, of God himself. So what's interesting over here is you see different elements of brass and different elements of gold. And he's telling about an altar that is for sacrifice and an altar for incense. And now he's going to actually talk about where you shall place all this, which is given in Exodus chapter 40, where he talks about where you shall place these. And in the earlier part also, he kind of gives some commissions as to where they should be placed. So if you look at the graphic on the right, um, there is the whole tabernacle, the 150 by uh, 75 feet uh, wide. The Holy of Holies is there in the, you know, in the western side, the north is to your right, the east is actually to the bottom and there's a reason for that. The Holy Place is right next to the Holy of Holies. The outer court is the place where the priests and the people will come to, to, uh, to offer the sacrifices. You have a gate that is on the east side. 
And then there is a door, the screen door that is on the east side between the outer court and the inner uh, holy of the holy place, and a veil that divides the holy place from the holy of holies. And these elements that God asks them to place is he will say, you shall place the ark of the covenant with the testimony on it and the mercy seat on it in the holy of holies, which will now be divided by the veil in front of which is going to be the golden altar for the incense. To the left of it is going to be on the south side is going to be the golden lampstand and to the right of it is going to be the table of shoe bread on, on the north side. The brass laver will be placed the washing before they enter into the holy place in the, the eastern side of the door or the screen door. And then the brazen altar will be the first thing that the people will be able to see when the gate is open to be able to get in. And it's right at the eastern part itself. And what's beautiful is there's a reason why God arranges it this way, as we will see in terms of how these elements start to start to reflect of the pattern that God has laid for God to dwell with man, to be the tabernacle with man, right? And so in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 to 2, we actually read that the Christ, Jesus Christ, is the perfect and true tabernacle in Hebrews chapter 8 and 9. And so let me, so let me ask one of you to read this quickly. In the interest of time, just whoever has got the, the you know, use the, the, the screen on top uh, that's being seen. And one of you quickly read this. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. Read the next one too. But Christ being come uh, an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building or creation. It's amazing where Christ is the picture of the perfect and true tabernacle for God to dwell with man. And we'll actually start to see how from the pattern that God laid in the wilderness to how God laid with the coming of Christ, there are parallels. And so let me actually go back and paint that picture and then we'll see what that means so that we can reflect and respond with reverence and love and worship. So Christ, the Ark of the New Covenant, the place where God meets man, he's the mercy seat on top of the law. It is the grace of Christ. That's why in John chapter one, verse 14 and through 17, we read, and the word was made flesh, which means and dwelt among us, he tabernacled among us. God was made flesh where God met man in Christ Jesus and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth and of his fullness have we all received and grace for grace and then verse 17 it talks about how it com combines the testimony that is in the ark and the grace and truth that is the mercy seat that is on the ark on, on top of the ark where he says for the law was given by Moses the testimony was given by Moses but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ and John chapter 1 kind of ties Christ Christ to be the ark of the new covenant, a new covenant in which the law will be written in our hearts, within us, not just placed inside the ark, but in Christ, his Holy Spirit will write and inscribe that in our hearts, which we read in, Ezekiel, in the book of Ezekiel and um, in, the new, in the book of Jeremiah, where it talks about the new covenant which we'll study later, but I just want to give you a preview of what is to come. And so Christ is the Ark of the New Covenant. Christ is also the bread of the presence, which talks about, you know, he's, he's the, Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 33 to 35, for the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven, from the very presence of God, from heaven, and gives life to the world. And then in John chapter 6, verse 47 to 51, he repeats and he says, not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of God, that only the Son has seen the Father, he has seen the father very well verily verily i say unto you he who believes in me will have everlasting life which means if you eat of me i am the bread of life the communion that you have with me because you have believed in me which is what we do when we when we commune with god in our communion is our res, our response of accepting that god's presence is with us your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead this is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and never die and not die i am the living bread which came down from heaven if any man eat of this bread if you believe in me he shall live forever and the bread that i will give is my flesh which i will give for the life of the world for the ransom of many so it's beautiful where christ is seated is the table on which 
that was in the tabernacle, Christ, the bread of life is placed. And if you read in the, the Old Testament, it says, and the bread shall be placed on it always, which means it shall be perpetually always be present on it. And Christ being the living bread is there in the holy place. And he is our holy place. He is the bread of life by which we can come into the presence of God himself. Then we talk about the golden lampstand where Christ, the divine light, in John chapter 1, verse 4 to 9, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. Sin cannot actually cohabit, co inhabit with, or cohabit with, with holiness, with the light, because when you turn on the switch, the darkness is dispelled. And there was a man sent from God, his name was John, and he's talking about John the Baptist. That same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, like we are commissioned to be the witness of the light, that all men through him might believe he was not the light john was not the light we are not the light but we are the reflectors of the light but we are to bear witness of the light and that was the true light who is that true light jesus christ who gives light to every man that's why when jesus was born a great light is shown in the people that were sitting in darkness they were wallowing in darkness of sin and death and defeat and doom and god comes and shines that light and john chapter 8 verse 12 and jesus spoke to them saying i am the light of the world whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 is a commission unto us to say, let your light so shine, the light of Christ Jesus in us, on the candle stand in our lives. It, you know, the church is the candle stand. And so we, as part of the body of, of Christ, as part of the church, let that light so shine in us and through us that people will see that light, which is the life of theirs, the life of men, and that they will glorify God the Father who is in heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, and 16 says that. Then Christ as the sacrifice on the bronze altar, you know, we talked about the brazen altar that will be placed on the outer court. And then here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse five, it says, wherefore, when he came into the world, when he cometh in the world, he said, sacrifice and offerings thou would not, but a body thou hast prepared me. Christ was the body that was prepared to be the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, which we read in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. And what is that for? In burnt offerings and sacrifice of sin, thou hast no pleasure. So God is saying, you know, that it's not the, the sacrifice for sin that God is pleasure, has any pleasure, but it is the sacrifice of Christ that is on the brazen altar. And so then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written to me to do the will of God. This is Jesus, he came to do the will of God and to finish the work. That is this one line autobiography that we read in the book of John. About when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, you do not, you, thou would not, neither had you any pleasure which are offered by the law, then said he, lo, I came to do the will of God, O God. He taketh away the first. He takes away the first, and with that he may establish the second, the old covenant, to establish the new covenant of grace on top of the law, by which we are sanctified, by which we are set apart through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And then Revelation chapter 1, verse 15 talks about that Jesus' feet are like bronze, as if he was standing on that brazen altar, right? And he became the sacrifice for mankind. His feet are like bronze, the base on which the sacrifice is being made and his voice like a like a sound of a rushing waters so and we see in john chapter 1 verse 29 john when he sees jesus walking on the on the banks of the jordan he says behold the lamb of god who takes away the sins of the world because he is the perfect sacrifice that was accepted by christ by god himself and then we talked about the basin or the laver, the brass laver that is placed before the, the priest has to wash themselves lest they die to enter in. And we see Christ being the cleanser, the basin or the cleanser, where in 1 John 1, 7, we read, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And Hebrews chapter 9, verse 19 to 22 talks about the blood of the testament. He sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. And it's an amazing, amazing picture for us to be able to see how God is, you know, Christ, the cleanser, is the one. And through his blood, we get to be identified with him, to be immersed under his blood. Uh, you know, baptizo or baptisma in Greek means to be immersed or to be plunged under. 
uh, you know, and that's the that symbol we have is to walk in newness of life. But Romans chapter six, verse uh, six, start very clearly says that you've been baptized into his death and in his resurrection, you've been baptized into his death, meaning to be you have not only been immersed, but you're now identified. The word is, is to be identified with Christ, to have been set apart from the world, which is the whole aspect of sanctification and the worship towards God in terms of allowing God to dwell with man and through Christ, we have the blood without his shedding of blood, there was no forgiveness or no purging of sin itself. And so there's no remission of sin. And Christ makes us his holiness, because in Corinthians, we read um, where he who knew no sin became sin so that we can become the righteousness of God. And so if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, this is your time of reckoning. This is your time to be cleansed by the blood of the lamb, the blood, lamb that the, the pure blood of the lamb that was shed for your sin and my sin. And then the altar of incense talks about, you know, the incense as the prayer of the saints, uh, which we read in the scripture in terms in the book of Revelation. And it talks about how those prayers will be raised up in terms of being intercessory. And the priest would have to come in and to be the high, play the role of the high priest to intercede before God with the whale standing in between the holy place, the ho most holy place and the most holy of holies, between the Ark of the Covenant, and the mercy of God. And, and then we see that Christ here, he became being come as an high priest is the more perfect tab tabernacle that we read, uh, Brother Charles read from Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. It's a really good verse to commit, 911, you know, so Hebrews 911, as to how Christ is the tabernacle, not made by human hands, but by God himself. And we see in the book of Daniel chapter 7, uh, where we talk about da Daniel chapter 2, I believe, where it talks about the stone that was cut out with not from any human hands, but it was actually God's you know, perfect cornerstone. And here we see that cornerstone, you know, as part of the tabernacle itself. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11 to 7, again talks about how it is the, the Levitical priesthood was not the one that was perfect, but the priest in the order of Melchizedek, Melchizedek means king of Salem, Salem means pre, peace, and so king of peace, and when he was born, he was given the prince of peace was his title, and you know, we see our pastor talk about the God of peace be with you so that the peace of God can remain with you, and so that kind of ties in together where it's evident, evident that our Lord actually sprang out of Judah, not from Levi, which means the Levitical priesthood, while it was necessary at that time and commissioned for man uh, through the nation of Israel to be set apart, to be a reflection of God, to be God's people in Christ Jesus. We now, from the Lion of Judah, we see that the seed of the woman, you know, the Lion of Judah, we, we see that we are now accepted into God to be God's people. And then 1 John 2, 1, it says, my little children, these things are right unto you, that you do not, do not sin. And if any man sin, saying that you do not sin, I don't want you to sin. But if you do sin, and we do sin, we have an advocate, an intercessor in between God and man. And the good news is that the veil actually was actually completely torn. Now, I want you to see this picture. And that's the reason why I wanted to make sure we had the screen sharing enabled over here, which is the perfect tabernacle in Christ and the way that the very elements were arranged in fact, give us the picture of the cross, the Ark of the Covenant on top, the golden altar, the high priest of Christ over there in the middle, in the center of it, who is interceding for us with the golden lampstand so that on the left, he is the light of the world. On the right, he is the bread of life that gives life unto all. And then below, as we come to the outer coach, the brass laver or the brass basin, which talks about the washing that is necessary for any man or woman, any of creation to enter into the presence of God has to be washed under the blood of Jesus Christ. And then the brazen altar, which is you cannot even enter into the presence of God without having accepted the very sacrifice of Jesus Christ himself. And so when you start seeing this, what you notice is the gate is in the east, right? And then what did Matthew 2, what does Matthew 2, 2 say? The Matthew 2, 2 talks about where, where the, the Magi come and they tell the, the King Herod and they say, where is he who is born the king of the Jews, where is he who is born the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? For we have seen his star rise in the east. The gate is in the east, and from the east you enter in. As you enter in, you enter in to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior because of the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice where he gave himself. This is Jesus walking into the Holy of Holies. When he died and rose, what happened on Good Friday was Jesus walked in. In Hebrews chapter 10, we, Hebrews, we, we, we read this, where he becomes a sacrifice. He walks in. He doesn't bring a Passover lamb because he is the Passover lamb. He puts himself on the altar of wood, on the cross, 
and then his blood is shed and under the foot of the cross, the washing of the blood, which is before the door has to open for us to be able to enter in, for him to enter into the Holy of Holies as the high priest. We come in and the outer courts accept Christ and he, Jesus Christ, he sheds his, shed his blood on the cross over here, opens the door to walk in. That's why he said, I am the door of the sheep. My sheep will come in. They know my voice. They'll follow me. They'll come into the holy place where he is the high priest. And on that day, when the, the on, on Good Friday, when he was killed and when he died for the sin of mankind, that veil was removed for all. This veil doesn't exist anymore. And then when we come into his presence, having accepted the blood of Christ, we are over here and he is the light of the world and we reflect his light as the church to the people around us, those who do not know and were still in darkness. We are fed daily by the blood of by the, by the bread, the living bread that is on Christ himself, Christ the living bread. And so we take that bread and bread and we commune with God so that he is now shown to the world around that we are a different people. And by him, we enter into the Holy, Holy, Holy of Holies, where God is saying, I can dwell with man. I can be with man because of what Jesus Christ did. The perfect tabernacle. There is no better picture that can emerge from what we see in the wilderness to what we see today here in the, in the scripture. And, and with that said, I have a fun activity that I would ask you all to do. Uh, it's, it's a visual unit dot me is, um, and I will get into more of time of application and, and discussion here as well. Um, the, the visual unit dot me is by a person called Mark Barry. He's got this model that you can print out and this was Itai and Ruben's attempt to, to build the tabernacle. It's a fascinating exercise with the children that I would uh, ask you to do and also for um, you know, adults, it's a fun exercise to do. So, you know, you, you, I can share this link to, after the, the study is over as well. But I want to actually leave us with this question. Why the tabernacle? Why did God ask the people to make a tabernacle? Any thoughts? Because he wishes to have a relationship with us and okay. have, a, have a dwelling place among us. Excellent. So that's very scriptural because we talked about God having redemption, then relationship, and then a chance for him, to, chance for us to respond with reverence. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 8 to 9 actually says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show you after the pattern of the tabernacle and after all and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. And it's very particular that you do not deviate from the pattern because there is only one pattern of being able for God to dwell with man or for man to be in the presence of God. And that is Jesus Christ. And we cannot deviate from that. Emmanuel, God with us is God dwelling with man. And what God expects, actually, in terms of when he starts this whole commission in Exodus chapter 25, verse 1 to 7, he says, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. And then he gives them that they should take their gold and silver and brass, blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skin, badger skins, uh, acacia wood, oil, spice for anointing oil, sweet incense, onyx stones, stones to be in the ephod and the breastplate of the, of the priestly garments, which we didn't really get into. But He's talking about all these luxurious things that you need to bring and offer. But here is the thing, though, that they're willing to give it with their heart. And he says that they may bring, all of us should be bringing our lives and offering it to him so that we can let God to be his dwelling place in us, in our lives. And so with that said, there is a future tabernacle that is to happen, which we would like, I look forward to. Each one of us should be longing, longing each day to see this. And I heard in Revelation chapter 21, in the consummation of all things, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. That's where this all culminates to. He wants to be a dwelling place in us so that we can recognize who he is and revere him in worship and as a kingdom of priests serve him so that others can come into his presence to be with him under the blood of the lamb because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So in summary, and then I'll open it up for a time of discussion, the tabernacle was commissioned by God for 
the Israelites to build him a sanctuary from where he could communicate and commune or dwell with man. The pattern of the tabernacle was explicitly given as a pattern of worship with the edict to not deviate from it. The people of God were asked to bring their offerings of value with a willing heart to give the building, give for the building of the tabernacle. Christ Jesus is the perfect and true tabernacle. He is God who became man and he is God with us. His spirit dwells in the presence, person who believes in him, making that person the tabernacle of God. So with that said, I'm going to ask one question and we'll close. How can you and I be the tabernacle of God and what will that look like? So I'm going to open it up for, for discussion points and then we'll summarize and we'll end with, with a word of prayer. We should be radiating Christ and people should be able to see Christ through us. Thank you, Ruben. That's beautiful in terms of us radiating Christ, meaning it, we are actually the golden lampstand, the church through which Jesus, the light of the world, will actually shine through our life in such a way that will bring glory to God the Father. Beautiful thought. What else? You know, the role of the high priest was extremely important, you know, because the presence of God was behind the curtain and only through the high priest people were able to reach that presence. Right. So, of course, the curtain is gone, but only because of the high priest, Jesus Christ. Right. So, our job is to be in the high priest and go into the presence of the Lord through the high priest and then you know, bring other people to have put their faith in that high priest so that they also will, through the high priest, reach the presence of God. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. but this was an excellent study, Mano. Thank you very much. Praise yeah. God. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. so beautiful, Pastor, because what you're starting to see, the pattern of the tabernacle of God are the elements that are in the tabernacle that we learned about. So Pastor Reuben talked about the golden, to be like the golden lampstand, and Pastor talked about the altar of incense, where the high priest is the one interceding with God and man, this man, Jesus Christ in the heavens, who is our advocate. But our role as the kingdom of priests, as Pastor alluded to, is for us to bring those who are not in the kingdom into the presence of God, and to have them meet with God through the through Christ the high priest who will then intercede and who would actually who will cover them with the blood to be able to access God because the veil has been torn so but our role then is to be the tabernacle of God as priest as a kingdom of priests in fact the whole mosaic covenant is that where it says if you obey my voice then you will be unto me a kingdom of priests a holy nation right and um, and then it's a royal priesthood so to bring to show forth the 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 marvelous light of the gospel of Jesus Christ what else so we've seen. Well, no, I was, yeah. I was yeah. looking at this more from a, a practical standpoint in terms of, uh, as we heard, you know, tabernacle means that why tabernacle, right? That the question mm -hmm. that you had, it it is what is tabernacle? It's the dwelling place of God, and why? Uh, if you see in chapter twenty-six, uh, verse one, he says, "Make the tabernacle." with 10 cubits so it is more of that is what god wants us to right. make the tabernacle and uh, again what would that look like and that is a question i was reflecting as you were sharing if we were to invite someone home for uh dinner mm -hmm. even if your house if my house looks like a dump Mm -hmm. What we do is we vacuum the house, we clean the house, we make it, you know, ready for our guests to come so they can come and stay at our, you know, for a dinner or whatever it may be. The question I ask myself is, after accepting Jesus as my personal savior, my, this body becomes the tabernacle where mm -hmm. Christ comes and dwells. In my day-to-day -day life, the actions, the thoughts, the deeds, the words I speak, is it comfortable, is it clean, and does it make Jesus to be living in me in a way that is acceptable to him? And so that is what the imagery, you know, what would that look like? And I was just reminded that that's how we must live our daily lives, is to be the best we can. Of course, we cannot be perfect, right. but we should strive for excellence. 
and be the best we can for our maker, the King of Kings, who is residing in me. That must be the, the, uh, the way we should think when we say we are the dwelling place of God. Okay. And uh, that'll give us, uh, you know, a, a time to just shudder whenever we do something stupid. But uh, I just want to thank you, Mano. This has been an amazing time together. And this has been truly, you know, goosebumps when you were going through that uh, study. Uh, it's just uh, fantastic. Thank you. God Could bless. You please respond with love and reverence to a God so good and great that he has his mercy seat on top of the law to give us the grace that we need. And it's amazing to kind of see this whole, whole picture emerge. And you're right, and our life should reflect the spirit of God living in us and producing the work of the spirit that is clean. So anyone else have any other thoughts? I know we're running short of time, so. In the same um, lines as brother, oh. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Uh, in the same lines as brother Josh said is permitting our sanctification process by cleansing our sinfulness, I think is the, uh, yeah. one of the most important uh, things of so God dwelling in us. You use the word sanctification and I'll actually use two other pictures, the, the golden lampstand on the light, which is the light of Christ reflecting through us, being in us to dispelling all the darkness of sin is one aspect to it. And on the other side, to be filled with this, the bread of life to the word of God, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the word, from the mouth of God. And so to always be meditating and hiding his word in our hearts that we may not sin against him. And I think that's the cleansing and the sanctification to be in the presence of God. We come in every time we sin, we have to ask the, the blood of Christ to cover us. You know, we rest, recognizing his sacrifice and then when we are in his presence, walking daily, as the Bible teaches us, in the newness of life, it's that light and the life, right, that on both sides of the high priest that we actually use to become more sanctified. So, yeah. And Sister Katie? Uh, yes, Anna. So uh, uh, she was saying that uh, um, in, in scripture, it says, be holy uh, as I am holy, says the Lord. And so I think the, um, uh, the indwelling uh, presence of the Holy Spirit in us um, causes us uh, uh, to, uh, it, it, it spurs us on to be more like Christ. And mm -hmm. it has that uh, purifying and cleansing, uh, cleansing uh, effect on our lives. Right. So the, the be holy is actually it's a, it's one of the first commandments to be holy as I am holy, or some would render it as be perfect as I'm uh, perfect. And in, there's only one perfect tabernacle, and that is Christ. And there is no way. That's what the Bible teaches us. That we are accepted in the beloved. We we are, we when we are his his people, and the Holy Spirit is the one who, like you said, I completely agree in the context that it is not by our own strength, not by might, not by power, but by the spirit of God, right, is how we can actually be in that state of holiness. And uh, because he is holy and uh, is, is, you know, and, and without him, we don't stand a chance. And so letting the Holy Spirit of God operate in our lives so that we don't grieve him by our willful choice to disobey or to, to be outside of the outer courts is, is what this uh, should be should be teaching us as well. So thank you. Thank you for that picture. And I, is Dinesh, is Abby there with you or uh, is it just you today? I see, I see brother. Yeah. No, yeah. it's just the name. <laughs> oh, just the name. Okay. I was asking, you know, I was, was going to welcome her. So also uh, brother Vijay and I see brother Srini and others. Anyone else have any thoughts? Otherwise I can ask to close in the interest of time. So I think we should be closing here. Brother Vijay Kancharla, any thoughts? Uh, Brother Vijay or Brother Shini? I mean, uh, for, for, I mean, it's almost time, but when yeah, Sister yeah. Katie was talking about be holy in that context, it also has a connotation. Yes, truly, it is talking about moral purity and excellence. It's also talking about being set apart for God. Yeah. And um, so anyway, we'll Very good point. Yes. another time. <laughs> Very good. Brother Shini, if I can ask you to pray, can you kind of close in prayer? Sure. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this uh, time of study. We pray, O oh God, that even as our hearts are overwhelmed, Lord, with the depth of your word and the revelation of your word through your Holy Spirit, thank you, Lord, for Brother Mano, and thank you, Lord, for 
the clarity with which the word came out. We pray, O oh God, that our uh, lives uh, would reflect your glory always in everything, God. We give you glory and honor and praise and thank you for, for your son, Jesus, because of whom we can know and experience you through uh, now and through eternity, Lord God. We give you all glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. I'll see you in church. Uh, God be with you throughout this, uh, the course of this week. Thank you for the participation. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Mama. Bye. -bye.